stand and give God praise. <laughs>
But anyone who hears my teaching and don't obey it is foolish. It's like a person who builds a house on the sand. And when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. So Jesus just told a story. He's a carpenter. Where do you, where do you think Jesus is telling us to build a house? <coughs> on a rock. And in this story, do you think Jesus is talking about us really going out and building a house? No. I'll go ahead and tell you the answer is no. He's talking about our lives. We need to build our lives on a solid foundation because there's going to be storms. He talks about the storms, the wind, and the um, floods will rise. That's a metaphor for things are going to happen in our life that's not always good, right? We might leave schools. We might our, lose friends. As we get older, more things happen. They say the older you get, the bigger problems you get. That's true. <laughs> the storms will come, but if we are built on a strong foundation, then we're, we're wise, and that is what Jesus is telling us to be. So as you guys go through the summer and as you guys go off to college and you get more freedom and you get to do things where your more boundaries are open for you guys to do, we need to remember that we are built on a rock, we are built on a foundation, and that it comes down to choices we make. All the choices we make need to lead back to where we were rooted in and which is a rock. Because storms are going to come, bad things are going to happen. But it's about us every single day to make the right choice and know where we um, – Live. Also, real quick, I'm going to end this in Proverbs. It says, by wisdom a house is built, but by understanding it, it's established. Again, God's not talking about us building a physical house. It's talking about our lives. And so in Proverbs, when it says that, our house is built. We grew up in the church. Our families, our parents have helped us, our friends, our church families. But when it says um, understanding it, it's established. As we go out, as you guys go out in the world, in the summer, it talks about we need to be established and how we portray ourselves and the actions we do and the choices we make are us establishing ourselves, okay? So let's go ahead and pray, and will you guys repeat after me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And our parents, our grandparents, our aunts and uncles that brought us to church to learn more about you. And I pray... As we grow up in life, we make good choices and remember to build on a solid rock. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. I need to share with you that before we came in here, uh, we were given, I was given very specific instructions that uh, during the playing of the prelude, the pomp and circumstance was going to be played twice, and under no circumstances was I to stand up until the choir did, and if I did stand up before then, I was told I was going to be knocked back on my seat. And lo and behold, if we didn't start, and all of you stood up. And there I was, the last one to stand, because I'm afraid of the choir. <laughs> And I know what they can do. It's a blessing to be here on this wonderful day. Not only, we're, we're doing a lot of things all kind of mashed into our worship service today. This is the birth of the church, Pentecost Sunday, so we're celebrating that. We're also celebrating the great uh, gift that uh, Christ gave to us in the uh, service of the Lord's Supper. So we're going to be doing that as well. And also we are remembering the contributions these young people made uh, and having successfully uh, completed their high school obligations to now be graduates and also to be heading off to school and we are very proud of all four of you and we know that you're going to be an absolute uh, wonderful witness uh, for the way you were raised in your homes and in this church and we're grateful for you being here wearing your outfits and joining in with the children's message and keeping yourselves under control and so as not to overwhelm the kids with all the answers you were ready to have uh, during that children's message. That was very, uh, it was a great blessing. I invite you now, if you would, to turn in your Bibles, your pew Bibles, your personal ones, to the book of Acts. We're going to read, once again, the wonderful story of the birth of the church. That's chapter 2, verses 1 and following. The book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 and following. Listen for the word of Almighty God as we find it here today. Now when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. <coughs> Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in their own language. We hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken to the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me now? Wondrous God of grace and of love, we give you thanks on this day as we pause to celebrate so many wonderful parts of the life of our faith and of our families. And we pray today, Lord God, that you would bring your blessing upon us, filling us with the spirit, the same spirit that dwelled with your people on that day so many years ago that we remember here in our day. We ask today, Lord God, that the power of your spirit may so infuse us 
that the words that we have already shared may be joined together with the words that follow, that they may speak that one word as each of us has need to hear it. And so, Lord God, as always, I pray simply this, that you give me the gift of preaching and those here gathered ears to hear it and hearts to make it real. For we ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Many of you remember the famous story about the young man who was a, a dutiful scholar. Ever since he was a little child, he was curious about everything in the world and everything that he could possibly put his hands on to read and study. He would read and study. He looked at the natural world. He looked at, at the way human beings behaved with one another. He studied every field of science possible so that he could understand even the most nuanced parts of the universe. And he became so adept at this that he, he piled upon himself a degree after degree after degree and he became known as the smartest man who had ever lived. And finally one day his, his great sense of knowledge had reached a point of saturation where he believed himself to be the equal of God. And so one day he went to a mountaintop and he shouted to the heavens and he said, Oh God, he said, I can do anything you can do. I have studied the whole portents of the universe and I understand every single part of the cosmos, both the large and the small, and I promise you I can do anything that you can do. And I challenge you, he said, to a contest. And God being God was not used to people challenging him in that way. And there are challenges always to God's supremacy in people's lives, but never something quite like this. So God decided that he was going to put the young man in his place. And he went and he spoke to him on the mountain and he said to the man, then we shall have a contest. And the man said to God, okay, what is it that you would have me do? And God said back to the man, I tell you this, make for yourself a man, a living, breathing man. And immediately there was a great smile on the face of the young scientist for he, he thought he understood all the nuances of the things that make for a human life. And he said, I can do that. I can do that for certain. And so God said, go ahead, commence and do it. And in that moment of time, the young man reached down and grasped hold of the ground that was there. And he lifted up a pile of dirt. And just as he was about to do whatever it was that he was going to do, God interrupted him and said, hold on there, young man. He said, that's my dirt. I created it. You go make your own. Now the moral of the message of that little story is to put us in our place, to remind us that we are really not God, that we did not create everything, even though we find ourselves to be very imaginative in our minds and thinking that we can do all things. The reality we discover as we grow in our faith and we study even the, the, the world around us, we discover that there are intricacies and there are fascinations and mysteries that go well beyond our ability to understand them. And as we think about the world and we think about the way that God made it, I am reminded of how powerful it is, the idea that men have even been able to conceive of the circumstances surrounding the creation of the universe. Back in the 20s, there was a young man by the name of George Lemaitre, and he was a Belgian scientist who was also a Monsignor. He was a Catholic, Roman Catholic, a very faithful man. And he had a PhD from MIT, and he'd been studying the universe and the cosmos very deeply. And he had taken the theories that Einstein had put about relativity of space and time, and space-time, and he thought about these things, and he began to imagine the universe and how it had come into being. And he imagined in his mind as he conceived of the universe and its origins in that very moment before the moment when it was created, when there was nothing there at all, he imagined in his mind that there was a focal point, a, a singularity, a place in which all of the matter and energy, all of the power of everything that exists in the universe today and in every other universe that, that the physicists have been able to conceive in their own minds today, was compressed down into such a, an infinitely small thing, such a tiny, tiny space, with such infinite power, that in that moment in which God said, let there be, there was a massive explosion 
which ultimately this theory, which came to be adopted by many physicists, in fact, most physicists in the world, now believe that this is an accurate description of the creation of the universe, came to be known as the Big Bang Theory, that everything started in this minute compressed space out of nothingness that suddenly was made into somethingness because in that moment of time, all of the strictures, the rules, the regulations about how the world is construed and every part in it was already built in, baked in, if you will, into the formula that allowed this energy to construe itself in the shape of, of matter, the kinds of things that we sit on as chairs or wear on our bodies as clothes or make up our own being with the cells that we have and the blood that flows in them, that all of these things had their origin in the mind of God and began as a small thing inside, ultimately exploding and becoming a big thing outside. The moral of the story is very simple. Something from nothing is an example of how God works in the creation of things in the world. Always, God works from the inside out. Now, if that theory is true, and I believe it is, if the idea that everything that is created, that comes to fruition in the world in which we live, anything we value, anything of importance ultimately comes from within, then there is no greater example of that than the birth of the church so many years ago on a Sunday just like this, the one we call Pentecost. You remember the scene as I described it in the scriptures very vividly as, as the Disciples who now were to become apostles had been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, no longer external to them, but now internal in them, starting and dwelling within them. This, this power, this promise of what God had given to them, that the, the good news of, the, of Jesus Christ in the world was going to be able to be shared from person to person in ways that, that exceeded the imaginations of even those disciples and the fear and the anxiety that they had had in their own person because of Jesus' arrest and his death still lingering in their spirits, still causing them to be fearful and to desire to hide away from the world around them suddenly was dissipated because they were filled inside with the power of the Holy Spirit which reminded them and promised them that if they trusted in God's presence in their lives, they could do all things. They could share the good news of the gospel without fear of the consequences. That they could go into the world and they could speak that word of hope and forgiveness that was desperately needed in a world that was just filled with anxiety and desperation and so much recrimination and pain. God had decided through the power of Jesus Christ present in their lives to leave for them the Holy Spirit. And by that gift, the birth of the church began. It's a remarkable reality when you think about it. The idea that all that was necessary for them to do all that they did, which led to person after person, and the scriptures revealing us some 3,000 plus had been converted in that day alone. And then themselves going and sharing the good news of the gospel, empowered by that same spirit now dwelling in them from generation to generation to build the Christian faith around the whole of the world. All of these things beginning from inside with that one moment when the men who were in that room opened their hearts to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Look what has come of it. Church has done many great things in the history of the world, from education to medicine to science itself. Many of the greatest minds who have ever lived in the world have been faithful men and women who followed Jesus Christ, who believed as Lamatre did, not only in faithfulness, but also in the, the gift of the mind to explore all of the nuances of the world and to embrace all of its ambiguities and uncertainties with a confidence that comes only when you know you are filled with a power that enables you to overcome whatever it is that you face in this world. The obstacles, the difficulties, all of those things 
compressed down, managed, and overcome by the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the hearts and in the minds of the men and women of faith who have lived throughout the many generations, even to this very day, that have brought you here in this house this day to celebrate your accomplishment with the idea that this is but a commencement, a beginning for you to go out into the world and to take with you those things of value that you have learned and have appropriated and hopefully, God willing, the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit which will enable you to live a life of faithfulness no matter where you go and what you do. By depending upon the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do all things wondrous things for God always works from the inside out now many will question the value of tapping into the power of the Holy Spirit when they go off especially young people your age now, I know the four of you you're sitting here right now and you're thinking to yourself when's he going to stop <laughs> no you're not you're hoping I'll just go on and on and on <laughs> Ah, bless you. That'll, that'll go out of your system very quickly when you leave these walls. But you're sitting here thinking and wondering to yourself, how does this apply to me? What does this mean for me? The presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life as you go about the business of your life going forward. And the truth of the matter is it's really up to each one of you to decide. But we cannot decide that for you. One of the elements of what it means to be an adult, to make choices, is that you have the freedom to decide whether or not the faith that you've been raised in will be your faith, and whether you will take it forward into the life that you face, whatever it may bring, and that you will nurture it and care for it, and in the process of that, find the benefit from it. And you may be wondering to yourself, if now this freedom that Brittany so eloquently expressed lays before you with boundaries that are now made broader, sorry moms and dads, it's the truth. With these broadened borders that you will now have to navigate, whether or not you will choose to take the Holy Spirit with you as part of what it is that makes you who you are. I would encourage you to remember that if you do, the benefits are phenomenal. The opportunities will be great. You'll be able to encounter the world with an open mind. You'll also be able to encounter it with a heart of love and grace and mercy, the kinds of qualities that are necessary in this world and are so lacking, it seems, in our day and age. I remember reading a story about a fellow one time who complained he had a problem with his car and he couldn't get it to start and he couldn't get it to start. And finally, he went to the hood, opened it up to see what was the matter, and he discovered that someone in the night, while he was sleeping in his house, had stolen the engine. And he realized in that moment of time, no matter how much gas you have in the tank, no, ma no matter how much intention you have to go wherever it is you want to go, no matter how beautiful the vehicle may be, if it has no engine, if it has no power, it will not take you where you need to go. And I would submit to you today, that if it's true what I said, that God works from the inside out, it behooves you to explore that reality in your life. And as you take up the subjects that you will study, to imagine in your mind how God would have you behave and respond to the things that you see and learn and experience. I believe that God wants you for people to be a witness to his love and his grace and his forgiveness in the world. I encourage you then to own the faith that you have grown up in, that which you confirmed during your confirmation, that which you have heard in your family since the very first moments you were born and entered into this world, not only by your parents and your grandparents and your aunts and your uncles and your neighbors and your friends, but in this church, throughout all the years of your life, from the first days when you sat on the floor right here in front of these steps, to this moment in time in which you sit here today, take God seriously. Let him do a big thing 
in and through you. And remember always, whatever God does, it always starts and works from the inside out. You'll think about that, won't you? You'll nod your heads enthusiastically, right? And let us pray. Lord God, on this day in which we celebrate not only the birth of the church, but the advent of the new life that these young people face, we pray that you would give them the courage of the faith in which they were raised. Help them now to take seriously the obligation that they have as professed members of the Church of Jesus Christ to be true and genuine followers of your Son and to go forward in whatever it is that they seek and do with that faith, a component part of their very being. Help them, Lord God, to be filled with your Spirit in ways that will protect and preserve them against the dangers of the world. We pray your protection and blessing upon them that they may thrive and may grow and may make a great and a wondrous contribution to the benefit of all humankind because they were faithful in their living both today and in the many days to come. We ask these things as we ask your blessing upon us all that we too may be faithful in the same way. For we ask this in Christ's name and all God's children said, Amen.
to tag on to that. We do have lots and lots of resources for you here, and Will, don't take this the wrong way, but I hope none of you need an attorney. <laughs> As we continue with our worship, we now have the opportunity to give unto God his tithes and our offerings.